The standard model is um, the name we give to some, it's a kind of very modest name um, really for what is actually an amazing um, body of, of knowledge that explains a huge amount of, of physical data of the way the, the way the universe behaves at the at the, what the fundamental constituents and what the fundamental forces of, of nature really are and how they bind together and how they produce the world around us. So the standard model is kind of, you know, you'd think you'd call it something a bit fancier than that, but that's what it's called. Um, I, I remember I, I grew up in Manchester and um, there was a really, really good Indian restaurant that was called the Standard Indian Restaurant. And I think the standard would meant you know, like the, the, the standard, it's the big flag, it's the thing you're proud of that you, um, you carry in front of you in an army or something. I think that's the way to think of the standard model as well. It's this kind of, it's the best model. It's like that was the best restaurant, this is the best model. Um, it came about, it's really a collection of ideas um, with, with some really core underlying principles that bind it all together. And probably the, the core underlying principle is to do with the idea of symmetries. Um, and, and these things that we call gauge symmetries that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But the, um, the, the way it arose really was in trying to understand the fundamental forces of nature. So in the middle of the 20th century we had um, uh, Feynman and Schwinger and Tomonaga had put together a, um, the first real complete quantum theory of one of the interactions that we, of what we now call the standard model. That interaction was electromagnetism, which is you know, it's light, it's photons, it's what we see, it's the way charged particles interact. So kind of the natural successor of Maxwell's equations from many years before. Um, but they made it into a proper quantum theory that was super precise and predictive. And then people were trying to, and that was based on a, on a symmetry, it was based on an idea of, of symmetries. So people started to say, well, we know there are other forces in nature, we know there's um, a weak nuclear force that we were just beginning to get data on and understand, which is involved in radioactive decays. It's involved in the way the fusion reactions in the sun. Um, so try, can, we, can we use these principles that, we, that work so well for electromagnetism to describe these other forces? There's also, um, throughout the 60s and 70s, it became known, gradually became known, there were these other particles that we call hadrons that interact via a strong nuclear force, which is the force that keeps the protons and neutrons bound together inside an atomic nucleus. Um, can we understand the strong force in terms of these kind of principles, these symmetry principles? You know, when you have a good idea, you try and use it over and over again. So you try and use the, this idea of symmetries to, to describe all the forces. And actually, um, there, there are two big breakthroughs really in that then, in doing that. There were some, some problems um, in that. I guess the first problem is that um, the hadrons there were too many hadrons, there were so many of them, that the way they interacted didn't seem to match these symmetry principles. And that was only really solved um, in the 70s and 80s when it became clear that hadrons were not fundamental particles, that they're actually made up of quarks. And once you understand that, then you can write down a theory of how quarks stick together, what the fundamental strong force between quarks is, and that they're carried by a particle called the gluon. And, um, and that, was, that, that became what we know, part of the standard model that we call um, quantum chromodynamics because um, in the same way that um, electrons have electrical charge, you have to invent another kind of charge with a strong force and they call it colour. There's just no particular reason except that um, we like to use words that are not too unfamiliar, even for forces and ideas that can be very unfamiliar sometimes. Um, Anyway, it, it, the, there is a symmetry um, behind the, the, um, the strong interaction, this QCD, quantum chromodynamics, dynamics, which in, in some ways is very similar to the symmetry behind the, um, the photons, but it's a different symmetry. So, so there are, for instance, there are eight gluons where there's only one kind of photon and the other, other differences also connected to the fact that um, quarks can never be free on their own. An electron can be free on its own, but because of the nature of the strong force, a quark can never be. And that was all kind of worked out um, over, the, over those decades in the kind of 60s, 70s, 80s uh, and beyond actually, still into the 90s, we're still understanding this, um, how the strong nuclear force works. And I kind of skipped over the other fundamental force that's in the standard model, which is the weak force. And the reason for that is because on, on, on the one hand, the weak force should be easier than the strong force to understand because we kind of knew, we, 
we knew that it interacts with electrons and muons and we could see that so we didn't have to wait until we discovered quarks to work out what was going on. On the other hand it, it threw up some really tricky problems in terms of the mathematics of, of, of that um, of that force um, and people were misled a few times again actually by by thinking it was involved that pions were fundamental and it was involved in that but it, in the end it boils down to that there is another symmetry behind that force as well um, the unique thing about that force is that um, the, the particles that carry the force have mass so the um, well actually there are a couple of weird things about it the other weird thing is that it only it only interacts with left-handed particles and not right-handed ones, but that's something else. Um, but this business of the mass was a, was a bit of a roadblock. Um, and, it, and it mixes in with the electromagnetic force in a way that is not so clear either. Um, and in the end, to solve that issue of how you, have ma how you can have the, the W and the Z, which are the equivalent of the photon, um, for the, the electromagnetic force is carried by the photon, strong nuclear force is carried by the gluons, both of which are massless, but the weak force is carried by the W and the Z boson, both of which have mass. And that incorporating that mass properly into the theory was very tricky. And that led to kind of the final postulated particle of the standard model, which is the Higgs boson, which is what allows, first of all, the W and the Z, but actually in the end, all the fundamental particles to have mass. Um, the Higgs boson is kind of a, the manifestation of, of a kind of background energy field of the universe. And it's by inter interacting with that that the... Um, the W and the Z and the other particles get their mass. So in the end then you have a picture of, of these kind of arrived at through this kind of fairly tortuous route but quite quickly of um, a standard model which is based on three forces, there's electromagnetic force, the weak force and the strong force. Um, there are six kinds of matter particle basically so there's um, an electron and a neutrino that goes with it which has no electric charge and then there's the up quark and the down quark. And from those you can pretty much build the rest of matter because you, an up and a down, two ups and a down quark will make you a proton and two downs and an up will make you a neutron. And if you have protons and neutrons you can make all the atomic nuclei. And if you then have the electron as well you can make all the atoms and all the chemistry and everything that the world works here around us. But for weird reasons we don't really understand, nature has copied that again. So there's another heavier version of the electron called the muon and it has a neutrino and then there's the charm and the strange quark as well. And then again there's, a, there's another heavier version which is called the tau lepton and its neutrino and the top quark and the bottom quark. And then you've, so you've got these, these kind of three generations with four particles in each um, and, and so you've got the, the, the standard model there. And then those interact by exchanging these for, by exchanging the bosons we call them of these forces. So the electromagnetic force, everything that has electrical charge, interacts with. So that's everything except the neutrinos. The weak force, everything interacts with the weak force, although all of them very weakly. Um, and then the strong force, only the quarks experience a strong force. It ignores the electrons and the neutrinos and things. But uh, and then underlying that and allowing them all to have mass is the Higgs boson. And with that set up, um, there, there is, you know, there's quite a lot of arbitrary parameters in there, a lot of things we don't know, like why are there three generations, um, why are the masses what they are, why is the top so super heavy and the neutrinos so super light. We don't really understand all of those things, but nevertheless if you think that you've got those six quarks, six leptons we call them, which is the electron and the neutrinos and things, and three forces based on symmetry principles, then you can explain basically all the data that we see in our particle colliders, you can explain the whole of the periodic table of chemistry and therefore the biology that flows through it. That's quite, that's quite a big deal for something we just call the standard model. Not to say, so the Higgs was the, the last thing um, predicted by the standard model and was discovered recently, um, relatively recently in 2012. Um, but that's, as I say, it's not to say that there aren't open questions about the standard model. That, now that we've actually discovered the Higgs, then the standard model in principle can make predictions up to really high energies and there's some very weird things that can happen um, when it does that uh, that we don't fully understand. So it's actually very hard to calculate in some, some things with the standard model, even though in principle it could predict everything. It's very hard to calculate, for instance, the strong, in the strong forces. We don't really know how to calculate all the masses of the hadrons and things. We, we can calculate some of them and there's progress being made.
but it's quite difficult to have, you have a basic theory you want to follow the consequences of the theory through to understand all the phenomena that come from it. Um, with the strong force, that's quite a challenge. With all the forces, as you go to high energies, that can be a real challenge. Um, but the, there's um, interesting calculational challenges and techniques and physics to be done there. Then there are also things about the standard model that seem a bit arbitrary and we'd like to see. They kind of hint at there's some underlying structure. So if you think about the... Um, if you think about the periodic table of, of atoms, the structure of that table is part of the genius of it being put together because it's telling, it's a big clue as to how atoms are made. You know, you've got all the, 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 the metals in one column, basically similarities in behaviour in each column and then they're gradually heavier as you go down. That's kind of reminiscent of what I just described as in the standard model that you have, you know, the electron and its neutrino and the up and the down quark and then everything the same, only heavier and then everything's... Maybe that's hinting there's some, that these are not really fundamental. Maybe like the atoms, they're made of something else. Um, and maybe we, or maybe there's some underlying principle that means there has to be three copies of this and they have to have masses that increase. We don't know. So that, that, the standard model is so subtle in some ways and complex that that might even be built into the standard model possibly in ways that we don't fully understand. Or it might mean that there's more physics, more likely probably, that there's more physics beyond the standard model that we don't yet understand. Um, so, the, and there's another, I mentioned briefly the fact that the weak force only, um, only interacts with left-handed particles. What I mean by left and right-handed is they have a spin, so if a particle's going along like that, you say it's left-handed, and if it's going along like that, that was the other way, <laughs> you see what I mean? Depending on which way its, it's spin is pointing compared to its direction, then, it, then you call it left or right-handed. And um, the, there's um, a property called chirality in the, in the particles, which is very closely related to that spin um, business, um, that handedness. Um, and then for massless particles, it's the same thing, basically. And we know the weak interaction only, only interacts with the left-handed particles and the right-handed antiparticles. Um, and uh, we don't know why. We don't know why that should be. Um, is, uh, is there another version of the weak force that's even weaker that interacts with the other ones? Or We, we just don't know. And I should probably mention, um, I just mentioned antiparticles, I never really even mentioned them all the way through, but in the standard model also all these particles have antiparticle versions of them, so the electron has um, an antiparticle version called the positron which has got positive charge um, and the electron has negative charge and, and likewise there's an anti-up quark and an anti-down quark which you can actually make an antiproton with, they're, just, they're making um, anti-hydrogen at CERN at the moment with um, anti-particles of the proton and, and of the electron. Um, so that's all kind of there, anti antimatter exists. What we don't understand is actually why there isn't more of it, because you would imagine that in the Big Bang maybe you create equal amounts of matter and antimatter, because that's what happens in our particle collisions. Um, but in that case, where did all the antimatter go? It's not in the universe around now. We can make it, but there, as far as we can tell, there are no planets or galaxies made of antimatter. So that's another kind of mystery that we know the antimatter is there, but we don't know why actually there isn't more of it. It's, it's kind of weird. And I guess maybe the final thing to say is that the, um, for a long time in the standard model, we thought the neutrinos, which are these mysterious particles that only interact by the weak force, we thought that they were massless. Now we know now that they're not. They have masses, but they're very tiny. That's another mystery really um, as to why they should be not zero, but so tiny. Um, but the other thing is connected with, with um, antimatter, actually. So to make uh, antimatter is like matter, but all the charges are, are reversed, are inverted. So by charges, I mean not just the electric charge, but also the, the colour charge under the weak force, and under the strong force, sorry, and, and the, um, the weak force charge as well. They're all, they're all inverted. Now, if you think about the neutrino, it doesn't interact with the strong force. So it has zero um, strong force charge. So that doesn't, inverting that doesn't change it. It has no electric charge, so that doesn't change it. And actually the right-handed neutrino doesn't interact with the weak force either, because the weak force only interacts with left-handed particles. So the neutrino actually could be its own antiparticle, because you flip all the charges, but all the charges are zero, so minus zero is the same as zero. So that's a, a kind of puzzle, and, and, and do we, we don't, does this particle even really exist, this right-handed neutrino that doesn't, um, doesn't interact with any of the forces. 
Well, we know it exists because if they have mass, then that implies this has to exist. But we don't know whether it's really it's its own antiparticle. Does it get its mass in some special way? It feels like a very special and unusual particle in the standard model, one that doesn't actually interact with any of the forces of the standard model. So that's another very active area people are looking for, for rare decays and things where we might learn more about that and whether this neutrino is its own antiparticle.